So today we are we are going to speak about prototyping. Uh, so we are going to introduce prototyping in general and also focus on low fidelity prototypes that is the first step that we also ask you to, to do as a matter of prototyping. And we will do three steps. One is low fidelity, the other one is medium fidelity, and the third one will be the one you bring to the exam that will be high fidelity prototypes. But before, so do you have any idea what is this? Well, you can, you can have some, you can guess that is something related to, because it's written. That is exactly that one. So this is um, an hotel in Midtown, New York, uh, where you have these things here at each floor. So you have four elevators, five elevators, a number of elevators, doesn't matter. And you have multiple of these for each floor. And you also have here an area where to tap your card, the room card. And according to the floor you have to go, this screen will, or you, you press, this screen will tell which elevator you have to take. So it's distributing people into the elevators. Uh, in this case, there were, I think, six of them. And inside the elevator, there is no button. You, you cannot change. You cannot go to a specific floor from within the elevator. You just select before, and then you come enter the elevator, and the elevator moves, hopefully to the right floor. So this is, so, um, and this display is the display you have in all the floors except the lobby. In the lobby, you have still this display, but everything is disabled, and you can just tap with your card, and you can go only to the play to the floor that is where you have the room. So this is a picture from the 17th floor because it's the the grayed out and you can move to every other floor, but the, the, in the lobby, you just have the screen with all uh, locks over here. You cannot press anything. You have to just tap the card here, and the mechanism will be the same. Use elevator PE 5, 6, 4, whatever. So it's distributing people between the elevators according to where they have to go. So let's look at this user interface first and then let's have a look in this case it's good to have a look at the user experience more in general so first the interface any issue with this interface is sort of good or can be improved or is terrible what it's just a screen it's touch screen you can press the number So you're saying there are too many things and it's too, too little. Well, this is actually, so this is a picture actually, right? And so the real size of this, I think that is bigger than a smartphone. So it's, it's not a tablet as a size, but it's not even a smartphone, it's something in the middle. So it's not so small, uh, but, but yes, these buttons are, can be pretty close. So you can, by mistake, pressing 18 instead of 19. That could happen. And this is not about giving information. This is about selecting which floor you want to go.
Mm -hmm. but, but this is not the room numbers, these are the floors already. So second is second floor, and then on second floor you have 20 different rooms. It's already like that. You want to bring also the room numbers in the display. No, she's saying. Oh, I mean, there is nothing wrong with this. It's not that there should be something wrong with this, right? Why not? Why you don't feel comfortable? So you imagine to have these things here on the wall and you approach these and press a number to, to go to your floor. Let's say your room is floor 18. So you press 18 and it will say peak the elevator number five. That's what it's doing. The where these uncomfortable things emerge. So you're saying maybe the first f five co floors are red and can help. Well, this is a uh, grayscale as display probably for, um, so it's not color, right? It's actually just a grayscale. So, but with color, you have another set of issues. That is what is, I don't see colors properly. And so uh, I, I cannot really maybe, so you also need to pick the right colors and then as he was saying, this is already a lot of information in one display. You are adding another layer of information that are colors and color coding and understanding color. So maybe it makes it more uh, likely to see and to use, but it adds, it, it risks to add, if not done properly, uh, additional uh, cognition, con cognitive burden to understand, okay, but why the first five, five floors are red? and the other are yellow. There is a reason behind yellow and red, or it's random. So you're saying two levels, as you sort of was saying zero to nine, and then you press zero to nine, and then appears one to nine, zero to nine is individually. Oh, like a keyboard yeah. in which you just type the... Well, they start two, three, four, five, six. Six, there are six per line. So yeah, you're saying it could be a keyboard which you just type the number of the floor and that's it, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, and, and this building was actually 26 floor. And imagine if you have to do this for a smaller building, right? To redo the user interface, to remove numbers, to reorganize the grid. Instead, if you say free form, just type a number, uh, digits separately. I want to go 26 to six. And if the floor is available, it will give me um, an elevator. If I type 30, then that could be another level of user interface. And that is a totally redesign of this with pros and cons. Uh, any other comments you wanted to, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah so this is against the, the usual elevator we are you're used to and indeed when you go into this hotel you check in uh, the the receptionist is explaining to you what to do to take the elevators and it's explaining it for every single person checking in in the hotel Yeah, what, what she was basically saying, yes. Do you need the explanation? So what is this? Yeah. Why you have five of these so in a wall? The screen space could be organized better. Could you explain maybe what the thing Yeah, what is this destination? What's the destination of what? Uh, OK. Yes, it's, it's a move a, a little of control from the person because you have to trust the system that is telling you which is the best elevator. Um, so this is, I think, very focused on a efficiency uh, per point of view. So since the system, uh, I'm pressing 17 and you're pressing 16 and you're pressing 3, then 16 and 17 go to that elevator and 3 go into these other ones, so optimizing the number of stops and getting you to the room quicky, quicker. So it's optimized the, the path, the, 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 the route to the, to the floor, minimizing the stops, etc. But yeah, it removes a little bit of choice because you have PF5 and well, you also need to understand which is PF5. And typically you stop the first screen and then PF5 is five elevators on the right. So it's also run to the elevator before it, it, it go away. No, inside the elevator there is nothing, just uh, an alarm button. Okay. You enter the elevator, there is a, uh, a glass, um, the doors, it opens, and an alarm, and that's it. You cannot, there is no buttons in the elevator at all. Well, because they move the buttons outside, right? So. But yes, it's the same problem, let's say mental model. I, we are used to some kind of elevators and these are different. And so it could be some discomfort. Okay, but this is about the user interface mostly or discomfort about the model. Think also of this, of the experience. So you are 70 floor, you have this thing and you want to do, um, so this, this hotel and on the 26 uh, rooftop bar. So let's say that you have a room at 17 and you are at 17 and you want to go to the rooftop bar. What are you going to do? Easy, press 26. Good, and you, it will tell you PE3 and you go take PE3 and go upstairs. Same things for going down. You are in 17, you want to go in the lobby, you just press L. Um, and go take the elevator that the system tells you. I told you that this is a card reader. And then in the lobby, you cannot select any floors. So this screen is useless in the lobby. It's just for showing you which is the elevator to take. And the cards only brings you to your room. So if you have a room on the 17th, you tap the card and you go to the 17th. What I need to do for going to the rooftop bar from the lobby? Not you have to stop in some floor. You have to stop in your floor. So you're in the lobby, you want to go 26. So you want to go to, to visit your friends that it is another floor. You have to go to your floor that is 17 maybe, and then from there going out of the elevator because there is no button in the elevator. So going out the elevator number three, pressing whatever floor it's where you want to go, and then taking the elevator that could be different from the one 
you were coming there to go in another place. So while the interface could be sort of, well, improvable, but sort of okay, then the experience overall is more tricky because of this specific choice of having the card reader only enabled at the lobby and then selecting the floor. Okay, so this is more considering everything more fame or shame? Good. So let's move on. Uh, <coughs> um, so where we are in the process, we we already have sort of recap. So we we choose our domain. Hmm? You also choose your domain. Uh, you did some need finding. We cover some need finding, and we also provide you with some sort of guidelines, principle to apply to the design. And those principles can also be applied clearly to analyze interface like this. And and then we move to the let's say analysis ideation phase where we already covered tasks, sketches, and storyboards. And we said the storyboards are all about tasks. So tasks are needed to build good storyboards. Um, what we are going to, to do today, to start speaking today, is these other three uh, bullet points here that are about prototype, and it is about ideation. We are not going to cover all these three today, but we are just focusing on the first one in addition to an overall introduction to prototyping, that these are paper prototypes, that are the low fidelity prototypes. So what is the goal of prototyping? The goal of prototyping, and partially also the goal of storyboard, is making ideas visible. Start quickly to show something, to quickly generate a new idea, and also to evaluate those ideas and testing with ideas with others, within the group of people that creates them, etc. <coughs> and prototypes are all about this, are about creating, testing, and generating as much ideas as possible with different purposes, with different tools, with different techniques, according to where you are in the design process. So if you are at the beginning of the design process, you may be found useful tasks, storyboard, etc. But if you are after six months, after one year working on a specific project, it's difficult that you are going to create storyboards at that phase. You're going to create something more advanced, something more final. And clearly, <clears throat> these different tools and different techniques also depends on who are, who is the audience, the immediate audience of that prototype. So if are designers or other creators, then some things are more easy to understand, to get, to comment on. <coughs> if they are users, then there will be something different. We will learn according to the kind of prototypes and there are things maybe that you cannot give to users. So if you take a storyboard and give it to users, it's not that you can get a lot of feedback about any specific design choice, for instance, but you can get feedback about the general feeling about the story that is planned. <coughs> Sorry. And the error to avoid overall and we already covered this is to focus on the user interface before focusing on the task that people has to accomplish. And that's why we dedicated two lectures about task and storyboard, etc. because those are focusing on the task hmm, more than focusing on the user interface. And we will move this focusing on task also in the low fidelity prototype to start creating the user interface through that. So this is the goal. <coughs> and, and then there are many techniques to explore the various alternatives in design that one can have. And there are man many 
things to consider, not only about people, about users, but also about what you want to do. Mm? So it's going to be a prototype for a mobile phone. It's going to be so a prototype mobile application or it's going to be a prototype web application for a large desktop, or it's going to be a prototype for a vending machine, or it's going to be a prototype for a smartwatch. And each of these brings their own features, their own characteristics in terms of what you can do. Just imagine the screen space. <coughs> or the technology you can use touch screen so you can tap on the screen in some cases in others it's just visualization in others you need a mouse and a keyboard and this brings different challenges and different things alternatives you have to consider and in considering alternatives you always can have more than one possible device design within a specific de device or across multiple devices. And it's impossible to get it right the first time, so the first things you will draw, you will prototype, will probably not be good enough. And it needs iteration, it needs improvement. But the goal is to find the best possible solution at the specific stage in which you are. So, which techniques we can use to reach this goal? So, to ideate, we can use storyboards and sketches, and we already covered that. We can also use maps to get an idea of which is the space we want to, to explore, and also clearly prototypes. Prototypes of various fidelity, as we said. So we will start again from low fidelity prototypes in, on paper, but then there are video prototypes that are something in the middle between low fidelity, medium fidelity, and then medium fidelity that increase hmm, the, the fidelity, the overall uh, realisticness of the prototype until reaching high fidelity prototypes that are closer to the final product. So, what are maps? Well, maps, <clears throat> before moving to prototypes, maps are what you can typically imagine for, for instance, a site map, right? So, <clears throat> information and how to reach them, how to navigate from one place to another. <coughs> so, it's an eye level view of the major structure of the interface and focus on how people, how your user can move through the application without showing the specific content of the application, but just the relationship between the item. And it's related to the information architecture of the application per se. So these are two examples of maps. Um, What can we say about that? So let's look at the first one. So you know what is the first one? These old style mobile phone menus. This is a menu, right? This is a menu. It's a circular menu. where this circular menu, how do you imagine this circular menu to happen? Well, it's not circular, right? You, if you scroll or if you 
navigate through that so you need to then an action right to navigate so if you scroll you maybe end to page five and then you need to go back <coughs> don't you have a cordless phone or you add a cordless phone at home or wherever so not a mobile phone a cordless no nobody has cordless phone anymore so cordless phone you typically have four arrows and the numbers and you enter the menu and then to navigate between the items in the menu you just move next 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 and when you arrive to the last item in the menu you start again so there is not a full menu of screen but say okay you're seeing one thing at a time with a small screen so let's say that you open the menu and you see internet and then you press next and you go to network and then phone book etc and then when you reach games you press next again and go back to the internet and if you enter in the internet category you will have other things within that are either scrollable so you see one of them at a time <coughs> clicking on the down arrow and going up with the uh, the other arrow or again with left and right mm -hmm. so this is one way to represent a uh, navigation a navigation that is circular because you start from one point in the menu and then you move towards the left or toward the right there is no arrow here no direction and at a certain point you start again mm -hmm. because maybe you have a small screen and there is just one uh, item that can be shown on the screen so you don't have a full smartphone screen that's why it's say old style okay a sitemap instead that should be easier what is so first of all what is this website about tourism right so travels and why you say travels because there are tours budget tours family tours etc so it's about tourism you don't see the content of this at all but you can understand how a person can navigate this website and you can also understand that the website is about tourism and there are some specific features just from this map so how many way I have to go to the budget tour page starting from the index from the home page two why two one is directly from the index so this could be a navigation menu for instance so I click in directly on budget tours and the other one passing through the search and according to what I'm searching then maybe there is one link to the uh, budget tour page so this is a way to represent all the possible way to interact with a website and navigate through a website and how many way I have to go to the search results Two, who say more? Three, who say more? <laughs> so why two? Which are the two? One from index, I think, and the other one from this one. Why you say three? Because there is this cycle. Yes. Wh what is this cycle here? Yes, it's it's three, right? You are in the search result, so you type something. You press search from the index you go in these results and then from these results you can go whatever but also stay within search results in which case you stay within the search results no it could be also but also yeah you don't find so you search another thing or there are more pages 
10 pages of search results. So you stay in search results because you are page one, but maybe the things you are looking for is page 10. So you're staying there. So this depicts how you navigate mm, from, from a website, from within a website. Given whatever point of view, you always can find the navigation, how the navigation will unfold on the website. Um, what is one important thing so this sitemap that you will at a certain point forget? What is desire of a year? What's the purpose of this? Going back, Going back to what? The main page. From? From, page. from? From whatever, yes, from every other pages. Hmm? So there should be also always a way to go in this case to the home page but if you analyze analyze this maybe there is also a way to always go back to the previous page where you are mm. so again about control about uh, giving control to the user possibility to i am in one page i want to go back where it was mm. <coughs> so this could be implicit from the back button of the, the browser because this is a website or it should be explicit from the some action you can go you can have in the user interface that again we don't know which is because this is a map just a high level view of how the pages are structured how the information are structured and how you can reach one page from another okay so these are maps these are two different kinds of maps but still they show you how to navigate okay so let's speak now about prototypes prototypes <coughs> as the name says are well as this sentence says are tangible approximation so one thing to remember is that they will be always approximation hmm? So in this course, we will ask you to do a low fidelity prototype, a high fidelity prototype, and at the exam, you will have the high fidelity prototype that is still a prototype. So it's an approximation of something, of a product. So the final object will not be something complete, something totally working. There will be some parts that are missing, clearly not the fundamental one. There will be some parts that will be fake, there will be some features that are maybe missing, maybe the login or the registration. If you are not doing a, a, a user interface, a project on improving the login or the registration. Because it's an approximation. It's something that you show that is working, is working well, and you make your point. You make your point with efficacy and uh, with a good level of usability. And this approximation, as I said, is very level to cheaply and quickly evaluate and explore design decision. So th think about it for, for a moment before we, we move on. So let's imagine that you are in the stage you are with your project. So basically a title, a name of the project and a vision, and maybe some of your some task and a storyboard. Uh, and you know which is the process on our perspective, right? We are going to do paper prototype and then medium fidelity prototype and so on. Why this is an approach that could make sense uh, instead of just open Visual Studio Code and code the application? Yes. You can check if it works before actually developing the product, but what's the problem with developing the product? The it, takes it takes more time. 
it takes way more time mm, than uh, for instance low fidelity prototype mm, a low fidelity prototype can be done in one hour in a couple of hours entirely that's low fidelity you, you don't have a lot of all the information but you get some feedback from that you can make some decision you can also generate five low fidelity prototype and then decide what you want to do if you are going to to use it in code then imagine to build five different applications and then deciding which of the four you want to remove and maybe also the the one that is remaining what to do maybe change something it's a lot of work it's a lot of time it's a lot of effort that then you are going to to just throw away and not and you are not developing a, a full complete application in a couple of hours to test an idea mm -hmm. so the idea of prototype is quick cheap ways to create something evaluate something and then proceed mm -hmm. and we are going to do just one cycle of this one low fidelity let's say half medium fidelity and a uh, high fidelity prototype but you can have multiple low fidelity cycles and multiple medium and multiple high or different ways to do with the high fidelity prototypes mm -hmm. we clearly need to condensate a bit for the purpose of staying in a semester okay so here there are <clears throat> two definitions of prototypes so the first say that the prototype is a concrete but partial representation or implementation of a system design still quite generic and the second one say that is a prototype is a model whatever it is the model it could be a representation a simulation a demonstration of a software system in this case with its interface with some kind of input and output mechanism that should be easily modified and extendable extensible mm -hmm. so not just any but these are these characteristics and and in some way all the prototypes will let us see and feel how people interact with them in different way because again it depends on the level of prototyping that you have so do you know what is this black thing here so if you don't know cordless that could be if you never experienced cordless could be ancient history but <clears throat> any vague idea what is this yes so ancient history good cordless no you saw one once uh, what is yes in italian is palmare in english is pda personal device assistant so what's the the purpose of this we don't have them anymore right so but what was the, what was the purpose of this so why they they created this was was their function so why you should use it or you should have used one of these or not you but in general a person no. not not really <laughs> it's an organizer so you had this small thing like a little bit bigger but shorter than a smartphone with a pen was touch screen but not with fingers was you just need to use a pen and you can write something you can you have a calendar you can have messages you can see emails a sort of organizer for productivity purpose right you can go around with these things and say oh i have a meeting in that room so i will go there instead of going back to my desk turn on my computer and um, see the calendar or having a paper calendar with me so this is between the 80 and the 90 1980 and 1990 hmm? it was popular for business especially businessmen 
uh, and women that had these things with them so they can check the email while moving and they can have the calendar while moving there was no smartphone right so um, so either they have something on paper or on a desktop computer somewhere there were laptop but they were heavy so this was a compromise in portability <coughs> and the palm pilot was one of the uh, most famous producer of these devices and this was totally black and white so grayscale hmm? so no colors and then they in the 1995 also 2000 there were still some of these made by hp with windows on board with colors but the basic idea was was this one with more connectivity some wi-fi etc all of this before smartphones so this is the product the, the electronical product hmm? that was created from uh, US robotics and you can buy it and you well you could hmm, have bought it and use it <laughs> so this is let's say ancient history but this is a, a good actually story for prototypes before this was created from this what is this It's not even a paper prototype, it's probably something less. Hmm? Apply well, this is <coughs> sort of the interface you will see here, right? So it's just with some information written. So this is a prototype. It's not a prototype with the user interface, this is printed, but it's a prototype that in uh, uh, US, yes, in US robotics use for what? So you didn't have this, you have to create this. So this is, was the final output, this was day zero. What do you use this for? See how people reacted to the interface, more or less. It, it, you know, it's not a lot about the interface since the interface is actually printed, right? So you cannot really change the information on that. So let's not think at the software now. Let's think at the device entirely so there is a pen there is hardware there is a screen there is a size there is a weight there are you're not they are not creating a software application they were creating a product a hardware product with hardware plus software so what they wanted to understand before spending millions to create this and months to create this to engineer this So the form factor, the weight. So this person, actually this is wood. So this pe person just crafted a piece of wood of a, a certain size and printed this screen on it. And also there is a pen here. And for one week, it just pretended that this was working and went around the office using this like an actual thing. So it was a meeting and he was tapping with the uh, wood pen on the piece of paper um, to actually insert the meeting. Actually, they cannot insert the meeting, but they was pretending, so was doing all the action needed. To learn what? How it felt. And then he say how it weighed. Well, easy to use is, well, difficult to, to say, right? And in the sense that uh, it was comfortable to uh, put out and Yes, so if it was comfortable to carry around, 
it's the right form factor, it's small, it's big, is yes. What else? I think at least one thing more. Also, how other people in the same office reacted to, so it sounds crazy, you know, to go around with a piece of wood and tapping things, but also how people would react to have this object with them, to see them at meetings. It's a kind of interaction they would like to do with this pen, or they prefer the finger, etc. So to get information. And this was not the first one. So this was one of the prototypes. And when he found that maybe the form factor, the piece of wood was too big, he just cut it down a little bit and tried for another week, other three days, to see if the new form factor was better. And let's say in one month, he has some physical uh, specification in terms of size, comfort, so it's larger so which is also the height and the and the width of the of this it should be landscape portrait and also printed other pieces of paper if there is something in the let's say interface that could have been done differently etc etc so now imagine that instead of doing that they just went through and created the hardware device. So they would have engineered for, let's say, one year, and then to discover that it's too big. And they have to throw it away and restart again. Instead, with quick iteration or something that is totally fake, this is probably even lower, so it's low fidelity in a lot of sense. There is not even a working user interface. There was not even one person thinking about the user interface. It was just about the device per se. <laughs> so this is <coughs> a, a typical example of a low fidelity prototypes. It was actually one of the most iconic examples of that. But if you think also other products, so for instance, the first, so the iPhone, the first iPhone that was presented uh, on the stage was actually visible as a small iPhone, but then behind the scene there was like a computer doing most of the work. And before that, it was not even the, the phone, it was just a computer to test the things, and we just the phone as form factor, etc. So even companies nowadays use some level of prototyping before engineering the actual thing, especially if they include hardware components and not just software. Hmm? Okay, so <coughs> what we can learn from prototypes? So prototypes, first of all, have different level of fidelity. And for fidelity, we mean typical realism. Realism in usage and in appearance. So, if we put storyboard here, storyboard has clearly low fidelity because it's a story. And are sort of quick to create, in the first version at least. And then we have a low fidelity prototypes that are, are a little bit more fidelity than storyboards because you have maybe a user interface, buttons, etc. And require a little bit more time. And then you linearly, more or less, arrive to the final products that is the one that requires the most time at all and the highest fidelity as possible because it's something that you want to, to sell, to share, to, to deploy, to give other people to use for real. Hmm? So these are the stages. And you see high fidelity prototype is something that will require a little bit less time than final product and is still a good level of realism, but it's not yet the final, final thing. So what we can learn from each 
prototype. So, well, in storyboard, if we show some storyboard to another person, we can learn about the task, because the storyboards are all about the task. If they are realistic, if they are good, if they are representative. Low fidelity prototypes are made in black and white, so there is no color. So we cannot, for instance, understand visual design in low fidelity prototype because they're handmade most of the time. But what we can understand are user interaction, how people will use the device, the user interface. How will they understand the things that they will see. With medium fidelity prototypes, we also, in addition to the interaction and the task, we also can get clue about the visual design, because medium fidelity has a good level of realism, and so they are more accurate. They maybe are done on a computer, so they are more precise, the layout is sort of stable, and the space between buttons and objects are in pixel, and so you can really sort it out all the things. And maybe you have text, and you can have more this thing. And then the high fidelity prototypes are the one in which, in addition to the previous point, we also can understand about usability details. Because these things is going to, to be the one that is actually working for most of the, of the function of the goals of the interface. So all of these facilitate conversation on this item. So we don't want to wait the high fidelity prototype to understand interaction, because high fidelity prototype requires a lot of time. So we prefer to understand the interaction here, and once it's done, fixed, we can move to the next step and not think, not expecting to have huge issues with the interaction. Because in theory, if we did everything well, it's solved in the low fidelity phase. And similarly, if we focus here on visual design, we will understand visual design here, and so we don't need to focus anymore on the next stage because it's sort of sorted out from a previous stage. And the idea of all this is getting a prototype, testing it, learning what it's possible to learn, get feedback, fix it, and decide to either create a new low fidelity prototype or to move on to, move on to the next level of fidelity for the prototype. That is what we are going to do. We are going to create prototypes of each levels. Moving on. After getting some feedback on that. So just to give you an example. So this is a low fidelity prototype of a project of two years ago. I think. So You understand why it's low fidelity. It doesn't seem real. It's not complete. Hmm? In Endmate, there are missing information, like what is description. There are buttons here, but if you imagine it on a real interface, they would be bigger. There is an add here. Maybe it's not the best position. Maybe it's not the best choice to have it here, but there are reasoning behind that. So the low fidelity prototypes lay out the main information, the main design choice you are going to do. Like, I'm going to put an add button here to add a task to the list that is behind, below. And this is also designed for what? For which kind of device? A smartphone and how you say that because it looks like a smartphone more than a tablet and it's a design choice they decided to do this application for a smartphone and not from another thing this is the high fidelity prototype of the same application and it changed clearly They get feedback, they get reviews, they get testing. And they decided, for instance, that having the task with an add button was not a good idea. And then maybe there is an add button here. 
and then you can have all your tasks can be separated by dates this was about uh, studying preparing for an exam an application for allowing university student prepare for an exam and, and see there is no description anymore or task one anymore but there is redo laboratory two or redo laboratory one was still a, mo a mobile sort of mobile application a prototype that worked like a mobile application even if was done as a web page because it's a prototype you want to prototype the idea with a high level of fidelity you don't not you don't necessarily need to write swift code or objective c or kotlin code to create a nice fidelity prototype you can do it on web technology and mimic the behavior of a mobile application while using for instance web technology and it's fine because it's a prototype use the technology that is quicker and best for you at the moment to create what you want to create and there are also here some missing functions, like there was no login here there was just a button to switch between two users just to say okay this is the view of a master students and this is the view of a first year students that preparing for the first exam so you have a button that log in and log out immediately among two users and it's reasonable it's fine because login was not the main goal of this prototype but was handling this task studying better prepare better the exams etc so which are the characteristics of prototypes in general so prototypes can have different characteristics we have seen one that is fidelity but for instance there is purpose so prototypes can have a role I want to understand which is the role of a product in my life so like the palm pilot prototype I want to understand how that fit in my life I don't really need maybe much details on the interface I want to understand if a 10 centimeter per 8 centimeter is a good form factor or not uh, then there is the interface to, in to evaluate an interaction modality and also the purpose could be about implementation so technical aspects is it doable is it is it possible to do this prototype or it's no technology available now to realize exactly what you want so clearly this applies to prototypes in general we don't speak we have s said that we don't speak about implementation in the low fidelity but we will speak maybe about in the high fidelity prototype And which are the purpose we can have so we can have an expert analysis we gave the prototype we show the prototype to someone and we'll ask them to someone that is expert expert of the domain expert of user interface expert on application and we'll ask this person to perform an analysis under their own perspective as an expert not as the immediate user and so this person can give us an analysis so if it's a uh, human computer interaction expert they will do probably a heuristic evaluation evaluating the prototype according to some heuristics some some principles you can also use the prototype to check with some design rules some guidelines again this is not specific to a low fidelity or medium fidelity or whatever fidelity prototype but in general so if you're doing a knife fidelity prototype that looks like an android application you can also check or someone can check if it's fulfilling the guidelines for android application hmm? that are different than guidelines for ios application for instance and from web application you can also involve users so immediate users for instance in controlled experiment in which you give two versions of the prototypes and you control the situation and you say okay this is version a this is version two which one is better is better in term of number of errors is better in term of quicker to use to complete a task is better in some sense or you can use you can involve user in the wild so this is the high fidelity prototype use it for one day 
and tell me how it's going. Hmm? Or again, the Palm Pilot that was done with a very low fidelity prototype. Use it, bring with you for one day. And tell me if it's too heavy, if it's too big, if you want a pen or not. Which are your impressions, which are your feeling after using it for one full day or one week or more. Hmm? So these are different purposes and depends again on the kind of prototype and also on your goal. Hmm? If you want to launch a product then you are more interested in something than not just if you want to create something for your own or for a course like in this case. And then prototypes also have a property about durability and we can have three types of prototypes. One are the throwaway prototype. So you build a prototype, you assess something, you throw it away and you start from scratch. So you get the information you want and then you throw it away and do another step of the same level of fidelity over another level of fidelity. Then there is the incremental prototype. Uh, that is something that you do a little bit, test a little bit, and instead of throwing it away, you maybe add something, you refine something, but you use that as a base to build on. Hmm? This is easier to maybe imagine for an high fidelity prototype, in which you have version 0 and then version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, etc., and you incrementally work through it. And then, but it still be a prototype. So at the end, you use it to build the final version of the product that is different from the prototype maybe because again the final product is a android application and the prototype is in web technology and then you have the evolutionary prototypes that again is more used for the medium high fidelity prototype um, moving on that is the prototype that evol evolve over time and becomes the final product. So you're already using the set of technology you're going to use, and you're going to move code maybe a little bit behind, before, in the process, because you, or you want to rush things a little bit more, skip some phases because you want to evolve the prototype. So these are all possible options. We will, in the course, use a mix between the first two, also because we are going to do one prototype for each stage, so we don't have anything real to increment or evolve. And, well, then there could be different aspects of usage. It could be static, like the storyboard or dynamics uh, usage. You, you watch things, but you cannot really interact, or the interactive things in which you tap, click, and do something. And again, the fidelity could be low, high, and something in the middle, where the low is a set of drawing that provide a static, non-working, for real, mock-up of the user interface of this system. And instead, the high fidelity is probably, for a software at least, is a set of screen that are dynamic, interactive, computerized, and are working, again, in the main feature of the prototype, respecting the main task and the main goals of the prototype, even if it's not 100% feature complete under every single perspective. And clearly fidelity also gives us different level of information conveyed. So these are, let's say, two versions of the same page. right it's the same window in one very low fidelity and the other one is let's say high fidelity but let's say it's also the real thing but let's say high fidelity so you can again learn something different clearly from here what you cannot learn from this one we said that but again what you cannot learn from this one not even from the other if you just look at it so 
if you can interact you may learn about usability but also just looking at the pictures what you are not cannot learn from this cannot know if it's good or not just looking at the static images of these two things so without clicking Yes, you cannot know how reactive the interface is also here because you cannot just look at the image. But there should be one thing at least that. Can you learn about spacing, if the space between elements is the correct one or not? in this one it's like here there should be 24 pixel can you say that no you can learn here if this space in pixel is the right one is width height and orientation aligned here sort of not really, because it's handmade. Here, instead, they are, well, orientation is uh, a container, but sort better aligned. Do you know here which are the other options here in paper size? Again, not, not even this way if you cannot open, but still. Again, the spacing here, the size of the page, in this case, is more or less the same size, but you cannot really say if it's appropriate. If the preview, so, you know, this line is not straight, so this is not something that will probably happen in the real phase. What you can learn instead from here which are the options that are available, and if they are the right options. So size, width, height, orientation, for instance. And which are the other options, margin, paper, etc. Which are the information? If this tab layout is sort of reasonable or not, these are things you can learn with a low fidelity, and then clearly moving on, you can also look about colors and background colors so this is white and this is gray but here everything is white and this is red and also this is red but here is not so maybe they thought to have it in a different color but then decided not to and they also added this apply to that here was missing so in the iteration they added something Etc. So each fidelity convey different information and allow you to learn something different from one thing to another. Okay, so I don't have time now to start speaking about low fidelity prototypes, um, but just to give you an idea, this is hmm, sort of a low fidelity prototypes, and the one that we have seen about the study exams is also a low fidelity prototype. Tomorrow we'll continue speaking about low fidelity prototypes and hopefully we also do an exercise to kickstart then the assignment number two about prototypes. See you tomorrow and have a nice afternoon and evening.